Stay tuned for Trucker's Life Radio, coming up next on TNCRadio.live. Hey drivers, did you hear music on TNCRadio.live that you really liked? Or maybe you heard us interview an author of a book you'd like to read or listen to. You can get the books, music, and other products you hear about by going to our website at www.tncradio.live and clicking on the shopping cart. Hello and welcome to tncradio.live. This is Trucker's Life Radio. And now here's your host, Ron Frazier. Welcome to Trucker's Life Radio and tncradio.live. I'm Ron Frazier, your host. And as we begin our program, as always, uh, we want to encourage you to contact us at Trucker's Life at tncradio.live or call us at 717-426-9977 or contact our hotline, our prayer line, which is 24-7 at 1-866-515-9406. Whatever way you want to do it, uh, contact us and let us know about your story, about your concerns, or any questions you may have about the program. So this evening, uh, my guest is uh, Rebecca Jowers, and Rebecca is the president and executive director of Poyema, which I'll let her explain that to you. But Rebecca, we're glad to have you with us this evening, and uh, and hopefully our listeners will be educated on what you do and, and why you do it. Well, thanks so much. I'm really grateful to have an opportunity to share a mission and um, just to collaborate with other people that are interested in stopping human trafficking, raising awareness about it. So I'm grateful to hear what you all are doing as well. Oh, that's good. Rebecca, you've got an interesting history, and I'd love for you to share that with our listeners. Uh, Share with them a little bit about who's Rebecca Jowers and uh, why did you get into this? Yeah, that's great. Well, you know, it started a so I, I have a strong sense of um, justice. I am, I'm a survivor of sexual abuse and domestic violence and um, growing up became a believer and um, just felt a call to be a voice for people who don't have a voice and stayed home. You know, I'm an educator. I, I taught math and science for about, oh, 10 years and had four kids. And at the end of all that, stay at home mom tutoring math and I went back to seminary, and while I was in seminary, I learned about human trafficking, and I really went to get equipped to teach God's Word. That's my passion, but when I learned about human trafficking and just this injustice of children being sold for sex, I I couldn't be quiet about it, and so I stepped out in faith and started a nonprofit, and we've been going 10 years now. We have a safe house. We've really heavy on education. We've educated um, more than 25,000 people about human trafficking, so I'm just grateful and and humbled that the lord is letting um letting us serve him in this capacity in this area Hmm. rebecca you you've got an interesting name and as i understand it it is a greek name coming from the bible uh share a little bit about the name and how you chose that yes yes so then the the name poema comes from ephesians 2 10 and it means God's handiwork or God's workmanship. So uh, for we are God's poema created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he created in advance for us to do. And, you know, I did not want to start a nonprofit. I wanted to jump on board. I'm a team player. I played team sports my whole life. And I just wanted to jump on board with someone already doing something in the fight against human trafficking. And I, I couldn't find it, um, you know, 10, 10, 12 years ago, there weren't that many organizations in our area. And so Uh, The ministry started as an anti-trafficking ministry at my church, and I quickly realized this is way bigger than one church. And so God gave me the vision of incorporating the body of Christ in the Dallas Metroplex to come together and sustain a safe house. And so uh, starting a nonprofit, it had to have a name. And honestly, I prayed for about a year and a half for a name for this nonprofit because I wanted to be significant. And what I love about Poema is it um, really exemplifies what the women who we serve need to know. They need to know that they have value and worth, that they are God's poetry and he is the master poet. And uh, they just are beautiful and God created them. And many of them, of course, the biggest hurdle we get over is is the shame and just believing that they um, 
that they they have no value or worth. And so it works well for the women that we serve. But then, of course, we who are doing the serving are God's poema. We are God's handiwork. And the other thing that's beautiful is these women need to know they are created for good works as well. Uh, we like to take, we're hoping to take the women on their first mission trip pretty soon here. One of our former staff members is serving on the border and in Mexico and So we're really hoping to incorporate um, missions and serving uh, opportunities for the women in our safe house as well. You know, I don't know that I've ever heard that combination. And I think that's just a wonderful way to take an approach this. And, you know, being in the trucking industry and having chaplains connected to the trucking industry, uh, we see a lot of abuse. And recently we saw... Uh, a driver rescue a a five-year-old that he saw Mm -hmm. at a truck stop. I mean, uh, people don't understand, at least from our perspective here at TFC Global and and Gateway to Freedom Foundation, they don't understand the reality of what's going on, not just in the trucking industry or around that, you know, around the trucking industry, uh, but right there in their community. And I think you mentioned that, um, you know, you realized it was in your community. How did you come to that awareness? How did you realize, hey, wait a minute, it's happening here in my my small community? Yeah, you know, when I first started researching, um, of course, it was in a international context is how I was introduced to it through IJM and some other really great organizations. They came to WEC Week during seminary, our, our World Missions Conference Week. Um, And then I began researching and, and, uh, you know, I I really felt called to go to Cambodia. We have four daughters. My husband said, you know, I'm not really called to Cambodia. And I I waited a year and a half. Lord, when are you going to tell God, my husband, we're going to Cambodia. (laughs) And after I realized he he wasn't jumping on the bandwagon, I thought, well, I must be on the wrong bandwagon (laughs) because if God Hmm. hasn't convinced my husband. So I began really researching, you know, I was reading Acts 1-8 and when Jesus sent the disciples out, um, He started in Jerusalem. He started where he was, and then Judea, and then Samaria, and then the ends of the earth. And so I was ready to jump to the ends of the earth. Um, But I began researching just in my in 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 the United States, and then you know in Texas, and then just in my community, in my community, in my neighborhood. Um, I've had so many trafficking cases just in Rockwall, Texas, a little little community. And I just here recently, I, I grew, uh, my daughters grew up in a, just a nice little community, safe community. For 25 years, I raised my daughters in the same home. And just down the street where my babysitter lives, the house next door to her went for rent. The home was leased and a man was trafficking women out of the house next door to where my babysitter lived. And the way we found out about it, a woman jumped from the second floor window and ran next door to a neighbor to ask for help. It had been going on and nobody saw it because they don't know what to look for. They didn't recognize the signs of trafficking. So, um, and I've had, the more educating we do, people often call me, they see it now happening in our community, unfortunately. Well, and and you talk about, you know, your vision for this thing, and you talk about the educational aspects. I did read somewhere where, you know, you're being contacted on a regular basis uh, to talk about this issue. So at least there is a desire to see an awareness, which hasn't been there for a long time and still isn't where it should be. But uh, Rebecca, how, how do people reach, you know, how do people come to the point where they say, um, you know, this is this is not a good thing. You know, most people, until it slaps them in the face, don't have any in- interest or any awareness uh, or don't have a desire to become aware. Uh, how do you bring about that, that awareness to the people to contact you? You know, that is so true. And I'll tell you, I started this work over a decade ago. And, I, you know, we had this rally in Dallas and we got together and talked and um, I'd been doing the work for about five years of researching, researching, researching. There's a problem. There's a problem. And I was ready to get to the solution. But when we came together, I, I realized in this little work coalition that, that formed, there were so many uneducated people about it that, you know, I thought for sure the education piece was already where it was. Let's get to the action part. And it wasn't. People still mm-hmm. needed to know. And then 10 years later, I'm still shocked to hear people that don't know what human trafficking is or today often they have false information about what trafficking is 
um, mm. you know, the white, the white, the, a lot of pedophiles are perpetrators. It's not necessarily human trafficking. It may be a pedophile or a perpetrator, but trafficking happens differently. So I found that people, um, you know, like you said, mostly when their life is touched by it, a child goes missing, their cousin goes missing, their friend's kid goes missing. Often they'll, they'll, a fire will light, um, under them and they'll be interested. But, uh, for us, a real sweet spot has been through the churches, um, we, we've, we speak to lots of different churches, faith-based organizations, but then also through the schools. Here in Texas, a house bill has been passed where um, mandatory human trafficking education is required in the school districts. And so that's been a real sweet spot for us uh, to try to connect. And then also health care providers in the state of Texas have mandatory trafficking education requirements every two years to renew their health care license. And we last year... Had, uh, we got our curriculum approved by the Department of Health and Human Services, and so we are able to provide healthcare education for, um, or the human trafficking education for healthcare providers. And from that, people hear more about it, and then they're curious, and then they invite us to come and speak to their Rotary Club or their church or their office. And so I think it's really just kind of been through word of mouth. You know, I, I started a human trafficking, I, the first human trafficking 101 I taught about 12 years ago at my church. I just emailed some friends. I said, hey, I'm, I've been researching this. I'm, I'm educating on this. If you want to come, invite a friend. 25 people showed up. And from then, I have never had to organize another another meeting because people just started calling me wanting to hear about it. I really feel like the Lord's hand has been involved in it as well, to be honest, just making making the connections. That is so good. Well, Rebecca, we got to go to break. But when we come back, we're going to talk more about this and a little bit about your vision. So uh, we'll tell our listeners to stay tuned, and we will be right back. TNC Radio Live, your commercial driver navigation station. We're all about the news, information, entertainment, talk radio, music, comedy, and topics truckers want to hear. I'm Shelley Johnson with Tom Kelly. We're talking with retired NASA engineer Homer Hickam, who's the author of Rocket Boys, which inspired the movie October Sky. We're talking with Alex Debogorski. He's one of the original stars of Ice Road Truckers. Chip Davis of Mannheim Steamroller. Music icon and Grammy Award-winning country artist Lee Greenwood. We're speaking with racing legend Mario Andretti. Michael Martin Murphy is a legend on the music scene with wonderful ballads and hits like Wildfire and Cowboy Logic. Curtis Grimes. Michael McDowell, the 2021 Daytona 500 winner. Our guest this afternoon is Tom Bodette. You know the name, you know the voice. The Carolina monkey gouger, Jimmy Artis. Today we have the honor of speaking again with Long Haul Paul. Today we have Claire Dunn and Logan Mize with us. Stay tuned and stay safe with TNCRadio.live. Catch Landline now every night at 11 p.m. Eastern Time, along with an encore presentation weekdays at noon, right here on TNCRadio.live. Hey, welcome back to Truckers Life Radio and TNCRadio.live. I'm Ron Frazier, your host, and I am here with Rebecca Jowers, and we have been talking about Poema, a ministry to... Uh, help fight and battle human trafficking and bring awareness to human trafficking. And I have with me Rebecca Jowers. Rebecca, and we're we're going to pick this up where we left off. Um, I want you to talk a little bit about your vision and what your vision was and what came out of that vision. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about your mission and where you're headed. All right? Yeah, that sounds great. So, you know, learning about um, sexual abuse and how... Um, Miscon just so many misconceptions about it. And also it's just, uh, you know, they call drowning the silent death. I, I, I feel like sexual abuses as well. So many people rarely reach out for help. And so as I began doing some more research, I've been studying trauma for about 10 years and healing from trauma and what that takes. And what I realized is as, as I started educating people about trafficking, uh, they started referring women to me who, who needed help. And the best I could do was put them in a domestic violence shelter for 30 to 90 days. And they just were not equipped. Um, that's not enough time to help someone who's had a lifetime of abuse. And often trafficking victims uh, abuse started at very young ages. So the first five women in our safe house were abused under the age of five. 
Um, one was adopted for the purpose of trafficking. One was 18 months old, two years old, five years old. So, so abuse started at a young age, which kind of set them up to be trafficked. So, you know, my vision was um, how do we raise awareness about abuse, but then how do we provide long-term trauma-informed care to help someone survive and overcome and heal from the abuse that they've, they've suffered? And so that's, that's really what, where my vision came from. Um, just seeing that there was a lack of, of care, proper care um, for survivors of abuse. And then from that, um, the safe house uh, was the dream, um, a, a place where women could come and heal. So how did you, Rebecca, as I understand it, you got a home that was fully paid for and fully furnished and donated. How did that oh my all gosh. happen? I <laughs> yes. mean, how did the Lord pull that one to you? Uh, you well, know, let me whatever, tell you. But. Well, <laughs> You know, it's the little, it's the obedience. So I was terrified. I'm an educator, started a nonprofit. I don't know how to fundraise, but I know how to share what the Lord lays on my heart. So I've been doing a lot of speaking events and teaching, which is kind of my sweet spot. And I was at a church. A friend invited me to come and speak. After church, we, we, we all went to lunch. I was speaking at a life group. And after church, we went to lunch. And a woman who wasn't even in the life group, she just came to lunch with us. Uh, wanted to hear about the vision and I kind of shared, I feel like God is laying on my heart to open a safe house uh, for survivors to come and heal from human trafficking. And she said, really? And I said, yeah. And then we kind of went about talking after the lunch. She came up to me and said, Rebecca, God's been preparing me for three or four years to give my home away. And I'm pretty sure he wants me to give it to you. I didn't even get the lady's name. I was so shocked. I said, okay, that's great. We left. <laughs> and uh, several different things happened because I, I had had people offer, let me, you can use my house for free before. And it really wasn't for free. It was, they wanted to entertain on the weekend or like they, it just, I hadn't, you know, it, I was just curious about um, this offer and could too good to be true. Right. So two weeks later, the Holy spirit taps me on the shoulder and says, are you going to call that lady? And so I had to call my friend. What was your friend's friend's name? It was a friend of a friend of a friend. And so I finally called her back and we met, had lunch, and she took me and gave me a tour of the home. She said, I have a home in Florida. I have a house here. God's convicted me. I don't need two homes. I'm moving to Florida. I just want to leave the house. I don't want to I don't want to have to move furniture. My home's fully set up there. I'll, I'll take my personal pictures off the wall. You can have the house. And so I was driving home kind of dumbfounded and text, you know, talk to my husband said, I don't even know what questions to ask this lady. And he said, well, ask her who's paying the taxes and the insurance. And so I texted her and said, Hey, I forgot to ask, what do you owe on the note? Cause here I started fundraising April 15th. This was June. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know how to fundraise. Fundraising for me was saying, okay, God, I'm going to step out in faith and try to fundraise. That's all I had done. <laughs> and so, mm -hmm. and so uh, she responded to this text and said, paid in full. Don't you love those words Jesus gave us? The, the house was fully paid for, fully furnished. And so, um, yeah, that's that's how we got our house. That was in uh, June of 2015. And in September of 2015, we signed the papers and Poema owned a safe house. Rebecca, I read somewhere on your website, it said, humble beginnings have led to great opportunities through faith and provision. Isn't it amazing how God works? I mean, if our listeners could truly understand how God moves, often not in our time frame, uh, but he does, uh, you know, use us in special ways and he moves in ways that we don't often understand. And so that's an amazing story. I, I want to talk about your mission for a minute. It's, uh, as I understand, it, it's to raise awareness about human trafficking and sexual exploitation um, and to help facilitate freedom and restoration of the sexually exploited. But uh, build on that a little bit for us, will you, and for our listeners? Yeah, so, you know, there's, um, I think for me, I think a lot of my mission came out of my own personal testimony. Um, when I recognized, I came to Christ when I was 18, so I've been a Christian about 40 years, but my healing from my own, my own abuse came through a personal relationship with Christ. Um, through that, a lot of healing took place, but then beyond that, there was still trauma, unresolved trauma in my life that affected me. And so, um, for me, I just, I really know that people can experience, I, I see so many people trapped in a, in a, in a crappy life, particularly survivors of trafficking, because they don't get the healing from trauma 
the spiritual side and the trauma informed care, the therapy to me have to meet in the middle. And several organizations are really heavy on deliverance and spiritual deliverance, and they deal very, very well with that, but they don't really address trauma. And then a lot of organizations are heavy on therapy and trauma informed care, and they do really well with that, but they don't address the spiritual. And so, so my vision was really to, to have those two meet. And to incorporate them because I have experienced such freedom and peace that's come and healing through my trauma-informed therapy, but also through a relationship with Christ. And that's just something I'm, I really want to share with other people and help others step into that freedom and live a full life where they, they can serve Christ and they can function. And, you know, so many women we've helped have severe mental health challenges, dissociative identity disorder, multiple personalities, bipolar borderline personality, all these different challenges that make it really difficult to function. So, um, so yeah, our, our, our mission and our vision and our goal really is just to help those women heal and be able to, to live a life where they can um, fully, fully serve the Lord and the gifting that he's given each one of them as well. You know, you talk about facilitate freedom and restoration You know, it's difficult because so often when women or anyone abused, because this refers to guys as well, uh, anyone that has been abused goes into a system of trying to be restored. Uh, They don't. They come out of it and often they go back into what they were doing before uh, because that's where they feel safe. That's where they feel wanted. And that's sad that we have been, yes. out, you know, with all the organizations that exist out there, that we have not been able to uh, put a, what I call, a complete program together to minister to that need. And it's really, I'm glad to hear that's your thinking on this issue. But, uh, but that's Absolutely. Yeah. And what you're saying is so true. It's the relapse. And so you have to understand stages of change. And I'm actually writing my dissertation on this t- um, narrative therapy and stages of change, how people change their life and what it takes to change their life. Because relapse is part of it. If we have a girl go back in the life, we never give up on her. She may have to wait 30 days to reapply to come to the home. But I know a lot of mm-hmm. places will kick the, kick the woman out, you know, um, survivor out. But relapse is part of recovery. And um, it's part of that, again, believing they have value and worth and they can live a different life, you know. So a lot, a lot of the journey of recovery is is part of that. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Um, Rebecca, how do these women cover the cost of coming to the home? Is there a cost that they they have to deal with, or are they supported from outside sources, or how how does that happen? So we are a five hundred one c three nonprofit, and the Lord provides what we need to help these women. And so that, that is, we don't, um, we have a transitional program where we do have women as they're preparing to transition out, uh, pay rent and actually goes into a savings account that will then be used to set them up in their own apartment with down payment, first month's rent, furniture, et cetera. But um, we, in our transitional program, we, we help women learn how to pay bills, budget money. You know, we set them up to be financially or to be independent and to be able to stand on their own financially. But when they're in our home under the, the program that we have, uh, we cover those expenses. We do have them, they need buy-in. So they do cover some expenses as they're able, but it's all on a sliding scale. And um, usually the first six months they're in the home, they don't pay for anything at all. Um, beyond that, it's good for them to, and, and there's a book called When Helping Hurts. You know, we don't want to enable anyone. We want to set them up for success uh, to be independent and to feel good about themselves. So once they get a job and they're able to work, we charge a very minimal rent, which I said, again, kind of goes into a savings account for them. So, yeah, that's how we care for the women. And honestly, that the medical care, dental care, a lot of that we get donated by uh, partners. I don't think we've ever paid a dentist because we have so many dentists that are amazing that partner with us and donate their their services for the women. Mm. You know, that's a blessing. It's it's God's work and God's community that comes together to, to meet that need. So, hey, when we come back, Rebecca, we're going to talk a little more about this because I think that's prevalent. I want to talk about the three core initiatives that you guys have. So uh, we'll be right back. Ready for the power of positive and something that will put you back to a time you wanted to last forever? Music is the ultimate time machine. What was your favorite time? 
Do you want to go back there? LTD Radio features the songs of the 70s, 80s, and 90s that will transport you to a happier time. It'll make you smile and brighten your day. We could all use that about now. TNCRadio.live is proud to carry the great music of LTD Radio. Hi, I'm Dr. Christopher Cortman, and now for the Mental Health Minute. There was an excellent movie from years ago called City Slickers. Laughed a lot, enjoyed it very much. It featured some urban type guys taking a week's vacation, learning to be cowboys. And they showed them riding endlessly horseback and trying to figure out things to talk about. In one episode, they played a game called Worst day, best day. And they shared with each other the worst day of their lives and what happened, and also the best day. One cowboy wannabe was talking about his childhood, and he described a scene where his mother and father were fighting yet again, and his father was aggressive with his mother. And the story he told is that he finally got up the nerve as a boy to get up in his father's face and say, you get out of here. And he said, my father left and he never came back. And there was a sense of quiet. And then finally someone changed the subject by saying, okay, best day. And he said, same day. Sometimes going through the worst thing in our lives gives us the opportunity to grow and turn things into the best ever. I have a patient now, a young lady who was in a car wreck while she was drinking and she hurt some people. And she's ashamed and she feels terribly about what she did. But she also knows that she has the opportunity now to become sober and to become the very best version of herself. All because she turned the worst day into the best day. Be sure to listen to Building Strong Minds with Dr. Chris, Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central, right here on TNCRadio.live. Hey, welcome back to Trucker's Life Radio and TNCRadio.live. I'm here with Rebecca Jowers, and we've been talking about human trafficking and abuse. Rebecca, you have, as I understand it, uh, three core initiatives. Would you explain to us what they are? And, and how you came to make them your core initiatives. Yes, I'd love to do that. So we educate the public, and that came about just because I'm an educator, and I didn't know what else to do after all this research. I thought people need to know this. So that became core initiative one. Um, we engage the community, and this came about when a volunteer came to me, and she's a private investigator, works with a, another organization called For the One that are PIs. And they take posters of missing children to hotels, truck stops, convenience stores. And the organization they were doing that with um, was closing down that section of their ministry. And so I went to that ministry, got their blessing, and we, we picked up the ball and it has grown tremendously. We over, have over 600 active volunteers now that take posters of missing children to any place in the community where a missing child might be, either where a trafficker may take them or where just a kid who runs away may go, like a Walmart that's open 24 hours or a Whataburger. And um, we've been very successful in partnering with these private invest with the private investigator to help with the recovery of over 250 missing minors. And uh, the Department of Health and Human Services says within 48 hours of a child going missing, they will be approached by a perpetrator. Um, over half of these kids that were recovered were either trafficked or sexually exploited. And so this is a, a ministry that is a big part of our heart and where the majority of our volunteers serve. And it's kind of where we got interested in um, the truck stops and what's going on there. And um, our third uh, pillar is empowering survivors. And this came about... Um, after education and outreach, uh, engaging our community, letting them knowing about trafficking, people started calling me with survivors. And again, I couldn't really find an adequate place for them to get the care they needed. So I thought, oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to open a safe house. And so uh, that's where um, we came. And I really started uh, studying trauma and aftercare, visiting safe houses all across the country and taking best practices and um, 
I have a, a sweet family in Houston that has a safe house, Redeem Ministries, that have mentored me through the process as well. And so we opened our safe house. It was donated in 2015, 2016. We raised funds for staffing and were able to open in 2017. So that's where our third initiative came from. And then actually we're starting a fourth initiative. And we have always, I have always had a heart for men because men are driving the demand for um, trafficking through addiction to pornography. And again, not only men are addicted to porn, it's almost 50-50 now men and women. So I don't want to make this just a man thing, but um, mm. but um, as far as the buyers, you know, typically uh, I think uh, Sean McGraw, who's with ICE Homeland Security said, white middle-aged American men are driving the sex industry worldwide through sex tourism, you know, here locally as well. So my heart breaks for men. And we um, we often get women that are haters of men because we have women who have been abused in our organization, but the heart of our ministry is for men. And so we pray for men. We love speaking to men's groups. And I prayed for many years that a warrior would step up and and help start a ministry um, to men. And so we are starting a um, eradication part. So we educate the community. uh, I'm sorry, we educate people. We engage the community through outreach. We empower survivors in our safe house. And now we're hoping to eradicate trafficking through this initiative. And what we're doing is uh, we've gone to truck stops with posters of missing children. We'd love to get the truckers on board with this. They go all over the country. And so to have eyes everywhere at every truck stop and across the country looking for these missing children, and they're all registered with NICMEC, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. We just have that many more eyes looking for missing children. So what we've done is we've set up a a coffee stand at the truck stop, offered cookies. We have the Gospel of John. We have a a men's ministry, Bold, who are, they've overcome pornography. They are there. So they're there to support the truckers, to meet with them if they want to pray, to um, offer our missing kids poster, ask them to engage with us in this fight and looking for missing kids. And so that's where our fourth fourth initiative has come from. And we'll launch that in 2023. We've, We've had some trial runs. And another part of that is mentoring young boys aging out of foster care. So we have a couple of boys right now that we're aging. And at some point, we may even open a transitional home for boys aging out of care. And our idea there is that we can prevent trafficking from happening if we can change the hearts of men. And so getting young boys who don't have any mentorship, um, guidance, um, or family, what we'd like to do is step in and provide mentors, jobs, opportunities for school, and a safe place to live. Housing is so critical. People, I I just don't understand um, how I've taken my home for granted for so many years, because I'll tell you, most of the people that we try to help, the number one stabilization thing they need is a safe place to live. Hmm. Rebecca, your your heart is our heart. You know, TFC Global started as Gateway to Freedom Foundation because of our ministry to the trucking industry and to Hmm. men. And out of that came what we call the TFC Global Addiction Intensive. Twice a year for three days, uh, we bring guys in who are addicted to pornography, and they have the opportunity to be with professional counselors who help them through a process or start a process that we continue to follow up on uh, as they leave the program. And we have just seen man after man, not just the professional drivers, but the doctors, the lawyers, uh, the individuals who you wouldn't anticipate being part of this, uh, come in and and take part in this uh, pornography addiction intensive that we, we have. And that's partially why we utilize our chaplains at the truck stops around the country. Uh, to to let the drivers know that there is an avenue for them uh, to begin to deal with their addictions. And so we're excited about what you're doing because it's our heart as well. And what we see out there is a very limited opportunity for our men. And I think you hit a key point, especially the guys in foster care. So many of them who do not get adopted by the age of 17, um, you know, they're out of foster care. And right. they they end up on the streets because they have nowhere else and they're not helped once they leave. And so that holds true for our young ladies, too. And so yes. we are excited. Anytime we hear the opportunity to, to be ministering to these young people, and we try to do it on a regular basis, um, to get them the help they need so they don't go in, preventive help, so they yes. don't go into that 
that area of uh, pornography or in that area of being human trafficked. So we're, we're excited about that. We'll pray for your new initiative as it goes forward. Um, you know, a lot of work to be done. Uh, the, yes. the, the need is the fields are white to harvest when it comes to meeting that need. And uh, we're excited about what you're doing. How do you see your ability to, what's it look like? What are you choosing or challenging? Uh, how are you going to go about this ministry to men program that you have? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, Steve Glass has been spearheading it. He's a volunteer currently right now. And what we're doing is we're starting off um, in life groups. So what he's doing currently is meeting with men um, and getting them trained to be mentors. And so the first thing we're doing is training men to be mentors, finding men who are interested. And of course, mentor slash discipleship. You know, for us, it's all part of a discipleship program. And then we've also partnered with uh, a foster group, foster home called Bulls Children's Home or Arms of Love. And we've gone in there and developed, um, the men have gone in and developed relationships with some of the young boys there. And so the way it started is these young boys, we just needed some help uh, in our yard, you know, with landscaping. So we hire a couple of these teenage boys to come and work for the day. They're working side by side along other men in the yard. They're learning how to work. Um, great kids, two really great young men. Um, they're getting ready to age out of this program. In fact, one of them did, and he moved to, there were two brothers, he moved to Lubbock to live with a family member, and it just wasn't going well um, with that family member, and so he wanted to come back. And so now we're also partnering with a church, and this church, because we do not have a home currently for the boys, uh, we have a family at a church that has an apartment kind of out back of, of their house, a little one-bedroom efficiency um, they are allowing this young boy to stay there while he is uh, working to get a job. We have to help them get their driver's license. There's just so many steps to help them get to independence, get a, a livable wage, try to go back to school. So currently we're helping two boys and it's kind of been through building a relationship with a, a, a group foster home, relationships with churches and getting men trained and equipped and, and to have buy-in to be mentors to these boys. Mm. Uh just in the last couple minutes we have before a minute we have before break, what is an NCMEC poster? Okay, yes, Nick Mech. So National Center for Missing and Exploited Children is a awesome organization where you can register a missing person and they will always have a detective working on their case until they're either found dead or alive. And so it could be 20 years, there's still still be an active case there. And so when we put children on our posters, we always have them register with NICMEC and which is, is this what that stands for. And part of the reason for that too is, you know, when we're dealing with minors, we have to get permission from the parent to have the poster of a minor, um, you know, put out there publicly. And so, but the main reason also, um, there, there have been some laws that have been passed. So for instance, I don't know if this is a state law. I, I, it is here in Texas. I don't know if it's beyond that, but if a child in foster care runs, when they age out of foster care, no one's looking for them anymore. But if they're registered with NCMEC, there's always someone going to be looking for that kid, even if they age out of foster care. Uh, Rebecca, that's great information for our listeners. And yeah. as we come back, we're going to ask you how our listeners can get involved with your ministry. Uh, so we ask them to stay tuned. Uh, this is a great program. Uh, you're going to want to hear how you can be involved in it. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. For the best information source when it comes to trucking industry business news, go to thetrucker.com. From the latest spot rates and freight market stats to who's buying who and who's partnering with who in the world of motor carriers and fleets, the business page provides valuable insights on every aspect of the trucking industry. In addition, the section offers tips for making the most of carrier and driver discounts at travel centers across the nation. Wondering how COVID-19 is impacting the industry this week? Need tips for building business as an owner-operator or choosing the best carrier as a company driver? Curious about the latest news about nuclear verdicts? Find these answers and more in the business section of thetrucker.com. The Trucker News staff produces engaging business content for not only thetrucker.com, but also the Trucker newspaper, which has served the trucking industry for more than 30 years. 
With a focus on professional truck drivers, the Trucker News staff works to provide content that is relevant, objective, and engaging, pertaining to the trucking segment of the transportation industry. Just go to thetrucker.com or use the tncradio.live app to access the latest in trucking industry news. Join Shelley Johnson and Kathy Takaro every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Central Time for Women Road Warriors on your driver navigation station, tncradio.live. All right, Ron, final segment. All right. Rebecca, in this segment, um, in reading briefly through your website and trying to gather some information here, I understand that you have uh, a number of opportunities, whether in the home uh, or whatever, uh, to do ministry with your organization. Uh, this program is all about helping other ministries uh, promote their ministry and to get the help they need. So uh, I want you to begin to share as I as I introduce you again and we talk about the opportunities and, you know, I ask you about them. I want you to share, how can people connect with you? Um, what if, you know, talk to our listeners. How, if somebody's out there and they're going through an abuse situation right now, uh, what would you tell them? Uh, how can people be uh, involved in your ministry in one way or another? And what are some of the needs that you have, whether that be financially or just uh, in material things, uh, as far as other homes or whatever? I think you get my gist. Right. Yes. So that's where we're going to go in this last segment. I, I want to put you out there, so to speak. All right? right. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Here we go in three, two, one. Hey, welcome back to Truckers Life Radio. I'm Aaron Frazier, your host. And uh, we're talking with Rebecca Jowers, and she has just been giving us, if you've been listening, uh, you've heard just a wealth of information uh, that we hope you take to heart. Uh, but in this last segment of time that we have with Rebecca, uh, we're going to talk about the opportunities that you, our listener, could have to be involved in your ministry. So, Rebecca, uh, how do, number one, how can people contact you, connect with you, or what opportunities do you have for them? And secondly, what would you share with someone who's out there listening right now, maybe on the road, um, maybe they're just listening at home, uh, but they are victims of abuse? And what would you share with them and what would you tell them to do? So, Rebecca, let's start with uh, how people can get involved in your ministry. Yeah, that's great. Well, so lots, you can be involved in our ministry no matter what gifting you have. And I tell people that like one of the ladies that serves as on our board of directors, um, she's a marketing genius. That's her thing. And so she's never come to the safe house, doesn't want to work with the women, but she helps us with our North Texas Giving Day campaign every year, which has been very successful because of her kind of marketing strategy. So whatever gift you have, don't think it's not for this ministry because it is we have a cpa that serves on our board uh my you know i was an accounting major for four years and changed my major for a reason because i didn't love it wasn't my passion <laughs> but um uh you know we, pretty much any any gifting someone has we'd love to talk to them and hear how we can incorporate it within our ministry um some of the things directly that people do is you know education is a big part of what we do i am one person and I cannot do all of the educating. In fact, last year, God blessed us with enough finances to hire an education director to help me educate. But we are really big on educating educators. We love to train people, get them equipped so that they can go and educate people about this. For instance, we have a team in South Carolina now. We have a Poema campus there. And we just recently got back from there training um, people. We have people now that can teach Human Trafficking 101 in South Carolina. She's getting into the schools there and also teaching outreach. Um, they've started an outreach ministry. They're taking these posters to the hotels. And so um, if people want to educate or be do public speaking, we can, we can definitely get them trained to do that. Um, as far as taking posters into the community, you know, that is huge. We have about 12 different campuses just in the DFW area. We also have a Poema campus in South Carolina, and we are expanding into Oklahoma. We would love to get more outreach campuses, and we'd love to take it nationally if we can. And that all it needs really is, is volunteer leaders. We have to have people 
um, who are volunteers that will lead this ministry. And it's, it's not rocket science. It's easy to do. You just need to have the passion and, and the volunteers to do it. So we will get people equipped and trained to take posters of missing kids into their community if it's something that they would like to do. Um, and then here locally, we do have a safe house and we have all types of volunteers come into the home. We have people cook for the women. Um, we have people come in and teach the women how to cook. On Monday nights, we have skills nights. So anyone can come in. We had a lady come in who's a stand-up comedian and do improv classes with the women, which teaches them so many things about public speaking, about gaining confidence. And it's just fun, you know. So um, if you're in the Dallas area, there are lots of ways to be involved directly with survivors. We have mentors for the women as well. So there are a lot of different ways to be involved. And then you had asked the question if someone is being abused. You know, they can reach out to us through our website. Um, I would also have them call local. If, if, if they're in imminent danger, they really need to call local law enforcement. Um, I always tell people, if, if you're in imminent danger, call local law enforcement because they can help you right away. Um, but I've helped many women who are in a, an abusive situation who haven't reached out to anyone and they're not yet ready to leave their perpetrator. And so they can reach out to us. They can send an email to info, I-N-F-O, at poemafoundation.org. And that's P-O-I-E-M-A foundation.org. Um, or they can also call us. You know, we've got a, a, I've got a great, great lady that answers the phone for Poema. And we have an, a huge list of resources. And so if somebody calls and they need to be referred um, to services in another part of the country, we do have uh, a resource list where we're able to help people all over. But the number for our, our ministry here is 469-757-8888. Rebecca, so often people are afraid to reach out because of just fear, just basic fear. So what would you share with a listener who's like, I don't know that I can do this. If, if I do this, I'm going to be on my own. I'm going to be fearful. Uh, I'm going to be, you know, isolated and, and I don't deal well with that. So how do you, how do you encourage someone who may be sitting there saying, yeah, I'd really like to do this. Uh, but I have this fear thing going on and, uh, and I don't know how to break away. Yeah, that's a great question. And I'll tell you, that is in their timing. So I, I, were, I met with a woman for eight months before she gained the courage to walk away from her pimp. And part of it is she had to earn my trust. You know, she had to learn that I was a trustworthy person. And so uh, shame is a big part of it as well. People are very ashamed of what has happened. Shame is, is crippling for people. It was for me for many years. So what I would just say is, you know, for me, I have found that whenever I share my testimony, that is usually a deep point of connection with another person because they're like, you get me, like you get this. And so I would say here at Poema, we have many survivors on our staff. You can call someone who is going to get you. You know, if you need help and you call our number, they will connect you with someone who will be able to talk to you give you some choices, give you some suggestions, maybe other places to call that are close to you that, that could help you receive services. We're also, also part of a National Alliance referral system. So if there's a trafficking victim, we, re we receive um, a referrals from all over the United States um, to our safe house. We can also refer somebody wherever they are um, to safe houses all over the United States. So um, I would just say, you know, the first step is just pick up the phone and we'll have a conversation. There's not going to be any judgment. Uh, we will love and accept you and honor. Our, our big thing is honor, validate, and get curious. We want to honor women, um, survivors where they are. Um, we want to validate what they've been through. And then we want to get curious about how we can help them. Mm. You know what I love about your ministry is it's not just aftercare. There are a number of organizations who do the aftercare after the situation is done. Uh, mm -hmm. But you've really balanced between aftercare and the idea of wanting to eliminate this issue, uh, the pornography issue, which we know fuels this whole human trafficking situation. You've really seem to find found a balance uh, between the aspect of training and awareness and eliminating, you know, ending the game, so to speak, and, and, and a pimp calls it a game, 
uh, ending yep. the game and also the aftercare aspect. You're not focused one or the other. And too often or so often, uh, that's what we see from organizations. Yes, I am so passionate about prevention because to me, if you can prevent all of this from happening, you don't have the mess of the cleanup. You know, if if somebody had prevented childhood sexual abuse from happening in my life, <laughs> you know, um, or other people's lives, just getting educated. And I'll tell you what, that is the hardest thing to get people in the room to hear. I held a, 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 a prevention, a sexual abuse prevention training at a church of over 5,000 people. I had 20 people come to the training and it broke my heart because we advertised in the preschool department, the grade school department, but people don't think it's happening. They don't think it's going to happen to them. And I'll tell you, familial um, abuse is, is huge and just so difficult, so challenging. I've walked through so many um, situations with families that have been abused by family members and it's just heart wrenching. So but I, I, but freedom comes. I, I did a training, uh, a HT 101, human trafficking 101 training at a church. The, and I shared, you know, I'm always pretty vulnerable, shared a bit of my story. And a pastor over um, the seniors, so he was in his 60s, came to me and said, I've never told anybody this before, but I was sexually molested by my sister growing up. And I told him, today your healing journey will begin because God will take you to deeper levels of healing because what Satan had in the dark for so long, you've brought into the light and God is going to honor that and, and heal you from it. So, um, yeah, I'm very passionate about the prevention piece. Hmm. Rebecca, it just goes to show that we don't know who, uh, you know, maybe sitting in the pew next to us or in the restaurant or wherever we are uh, is experiencing some of what we've talked about today. And so there is that aspect of modeling and being aware of what's going on and sharing that with others. And hopefully, prayerfully, those listeners who have heard us today, and maybe they're involved in a church that would like to do something and become active uh, in having an impact on changing the trafficking issue and, and really changing and transforming lives for Jesus Christ. Maybe you're listening today and you are wondering what you can do. Well, you've heard it. You've heard it right here. Rebecca has been clear about it. And we encourage you to contact them uh, at Paema. And just, um, you know, if you've got need, if, if you're in an abusive situation, uh, as Rebecca shared, contact them, contact us. Uh, or call the local authorities, but you need to do something. You need to act. Rebecca, it's just been a real pleasure having you with us tonight. Uh, we will do this again for sure, uh, but thank you for the time, and thank you for sharing all that you do. May the Lord bless your ministry, and we'll, we'll talk again. So, Rebecca, thank you. Thank so you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Really appreciate being with you all today. Don't forget... You can hear all of our TNC Radio primetime shows again on our podcasts. Just go to tncradio.live slash podcasts or search for tncradio.live wherever you listen to podcasts. Do you have the tncradio.live app? It's free and easy to download. Just go to app.tncradio.live Google Play, or the App Store. Get access to live streaming radio developed by drivers for drivers. Download the TNCRadio.live app today.